In my opinion, Hollow Knight is one of the best Metroidvania games ever made. Everything it does, it does well. But one thing that actually plays a really critical role in game feel and level design that can be easy to overlook is the camera. There are a lot of nuances and complexities at work that are hard to notice, but you'd definitely feel them if they weren't there. And since I could not find a single tutorial anywhere on the internet, I decided to try to recreate the Hollow Knight camera system myself using Unity and Cinemachine. So first, let me break down what we're trying to recreate, and then we'll dive into Unity. Let's start simple. When the knight is idle, the camera is always slightly biased toward the direction he's looking, and it smoothly pans whenever you turn around. This helps the players by giving a subtle indication of which direction the knight is looking, and helps with combat and platforming by helping you see relevant parts of the game slightly earlier, giving you a little more time to prepare for them. Next, the camera obviously follows the player smoothly, and we do this using interpolation, but there are a few subtle things to note. The camera will stay tight to the player when you're falling, but when you're traveling upwards, there's more delay to the follow. And there's not much noticeable interpolation on the horizontal movement, but there's enough to not make you dizzy when the player dashes. When you compare this to this, you can really see what I mean. Getting your interpolation settings right is actually one of the secret elements of having a really good player controller. The player's movement and the camera movement both play a key role. I literally never noticed this when playing the game, but the camera actually has ledge detection. If you are able or meant to fall off a ledge and travel down, the camera will pan down slightly, giving a subtle nod to the player to let them know, yes, you are meant to go down there. It's a way of telling the player where to go without actually telling them where to go. There are different camera controls for different types of rooms. In large open spaces where you have lots of room for horizontal and vertical movement, the camera is close following and vertically locked with the player in the center. In tight corridors, the camera won't move vertically at all. And certain key rooms, the camera won't move at all, period, and will pan to a specific position and stay there until you leave the room. This is especially useful for boss rooms, and it can make combat easier when you aren't fighting against the boss and the camera. And lastly, we have camera bounds. Camera bounds are important for two reasons. We can utilize the bounds to ensure we aren't seeing ugly parts of the level that don't need to be seen, like too much of the ground or too far behind a wall. Second, Hollow Knight is a metroidvania, which means there are secrets everywhere. And you do not want a secret room or hidden treasure to be given away because your camera allowed the player to see behind a breakable wall. All right, so we are going to accomplish all of these things using a Cinemachine camera system in Unity. And by the way, all the assets you see me using in this project are available for you to download. They are free, and you can even use them commercially in your game if you want. Go ahead and use them in whatever way you like. They are yours. Now, here we go. I want to handle the camera panning in the direction that the player is facing first. Make sure you have Cinemachine installed. You can search for it in the Package Manager. And set up a new 2D camera. And go ahead and drag your player into the follow slot. I did a lot of testing for decent framing transposer settings and I really liked these, so go ahead and change yours to these as well, but let me know if you find settings that you like better down in the comments. One thing that's important to note is how my player turns around. One common way to turn your player around is to flip the X on the sprite renderer. I don't do that. Another common way is to flip the scale on the X to negative to get him to turn around. I don't do that either. I flip my player by rotating the Y axis by 180 degrees. Here's the code for that. And these are called in fixed update if we are detecting movement. I usually see this done in update, but I find you can have minor physics hiccups if you are using a rigid body for gravity, and you don't put this in fixed update, if you are turning your player by rotating him on the y-axis. The reason I turn my player this way is because it actually flips the player's transform.right, which is great because the tracked object offset respects the facing direction of your player. So we are going to set this to 1. And right away we can see that this is giving that slight bias that we want but there's a problem. Doing it this way snaps our offset instantly in one frame when we turn around, and I find it just a little bit jarring, especially in the air. And the damping helps, but we can do better. And we could lerp our player's facing direction slowly on the Y, but this forces us to use a Paper Mario effect that I really don't want. So instead, we are going to create an empty game object, but do not make it a child of the player, because that will give us the exact same problem. Instead, let's create a script to manually make this object follow our player's movement. We'll set up a bool to track the facing direction of this empty object and create a coroutine 
to lerp the rotation of the Y smoothly over time. You could add additional control to this by adding an animation curve, but I've covered that at length in previous tutorials of mine, so I'm not gonna do that here. And we'll call this coroutine method from within the player script where we make the player turn around. Don't forget to assign your inspector elements. Set that new object to the follow slot, and there you go, it doesn't snap anymore. Now it just smoothly travels from one side to the other. One thing though is there's actually a much easier way to do this, and that's using a tweening library. I really hate tutorials that rely exclusively on third-party add-ons, so I'll only show this once, and we'll do everything from scratch going forward, but honestly, I use Lean Tween in many of my projects, and you can accomplish everything we just did with the coroutine with this one line of code, except it's actually better because it has easing built right in. So we could say set ease in out sign, and now the camera will turn around based on this graph. Here's a list of all the built-in curves you can use for smoothing with a tweening library. All right, moving on. Next, let's handle all the general camera follow interpolation. And we've already covered most of that with our Cinemachine settings, but there's one thing I'd like to add. Making the damping high when our player is moving upwards, and tight when our player is falling. Because you can see that when we're falling, we can't see too far below our player, which isn't really fair if there's an enemy waiting right below us. We need space to see that. You'll want an empty that holds your cameras, because Cinemachine is built to use multiple cameras. Having one super camera that does everything makes some weird OCD part of my brain happy, but if you're using Cinemachine, then you'll have a much easier time if you drop that mindset. We are going to be using multiple cameras. On our parent object, let's add a script called Camera Manager, and make it a singleton, since there will only ever be one, and this will just make it easier to call public methods from this class. We'll need variables for a coroutine, three floats to control our distance and time of the camera pan, two bools to track our states, our Cinemachine framing transposer, and don't forget the Cinemachine namespace. And actually, since we're going to have multiple cameras, let's create an array of virtual cameras. Create one more virtual camera variable and set that to be equal to whichever one is active in the scene. And from that, we can grab our framing transposer variable. We can finally set up one more float and set that to the framing transposer's Y damping amount. And let's add a bool argument so that we can use the same method based on whether our player is falling or not. And we'll lerp the Y damping on our virtual camera, which means we aren't directly controlling the camera itself, we're smoothly decreasing the damping on the Y when we're falling, and smoothly increasing it when we're not, which I find looks and feels pretty good. To call this method, go back to your player controller. Let's set up a float for the speed threshold where we'll actually call it so it doesn't get called every time there's a slight change in our vertical speed, and call it if our speed on the Y axis is below our threshold, and it's not currently already running, and reverse it if our vertical speed is greater than or equal to zero and it's not currently running. Don't forget to assign our virtual camera to the parent camera's object. Now you can see the Y damping decreasing when our player is falling and increasing back up as soon as they're standing. And also when we fall, we can see a lot more space below us as well, which is awesome. Let's handle camera bounds next. To do that, let's add a Cinemachine Confiner 2D extension to our virtual camera. Now you'll need a Collider 2D for the bounding shape. Most resources online will tell you to use a Polygon Collider 2D, and you can absolutely do that. You can fit it around your rooms, make sure it's a trigger so it doesn't affect your player, and assign it. One clean collider. The problem is, I hate Polygon Colliders. They're annoying to create, and they're annoying to shape the way you want. You're going to want straight lines along the floor because the camera will respect those bounds to a fault, and and if it's not straight, it's gonna look really weird, and everything about this workflow just makes me angry. The good news is you can also use Box Collider 2Ds. The only caveat is that you need to also add a Composite Collider 2D. That's gonna create a rigid body, which you can set to static, and then check Is Trigger on the Composite Collider, and then check Used by Composite on the Box Collider 2D. And if you are getting this error, it's because your Composite Collider has to be at the top. Cinemachine looks for a Collider 2D component, and it'll just return the first one it finds. But Box Colliders by themselves aren't valid, so make sure this is at the top. Also, make sure you set the geometry type to polygons. Now, the cool thing here is that you can add as many box colliders or even polygon colliders to this composite collider as you want. It's going to take them all and combine them into one trigger collider. You'll notice only your first box collider 2D has this edit collider button here, but when you click it, you can just adjust all of them at the same time. So composite or polygon, whichever you want. But you'll notice I created nice tight colliders around my walls and floor, and if I play, it follows these exactly. But it's also a little unintuitive at first, because little coves like this, all of a sudden, your camera won't follow your player. 
And that's because the camera literally will not go outside of our bounds we've set, even if it's just a little corner. And here's where these other settings come in handy. If we select this oversized window box here, this will make Cinemachine compute a skeleton polygon so that it can handle cases where the camera window size is larger than little areas like this that are tightly confined. This is really expensive computationally, so you might not want to use this, but I do use it in my games. To help with resources, you can enter your camera's largest orthographic setting you allow it to have. Have. We're recreating Hollow Knight's camera here, which never zooms in or out, so we can just set our orthographic size here. If you are using a perspective camera, I'm honestly not sure what number should go here, but let me know in the comments down below if you know the answer to that. And we can control the amount of damping here. And you can see that this helps, but it's not a perfect solution. It is resource intensive, and you might want to instead just expand the boundaries for your level. It really depends on your needs. But keep in mind that with this option enabled, it will sometimes allow the camera outside of your level boundary, which is by design. So if you want absolute 100% control, you might just need to put a little more thought into how you set the boundaries around your level. Now, let's handle ledge detection. And actually, we're gonna handle swapping cameras in the same script at the same time. And I really think you guys are gonna like this. Create an empty game object with a box collider 2D set to trigger. And let's add a script to it called camera control trigger. Now, we are going to add a lot of functionality to this one little script, and we want it to be clean because we sometimes want to use it to swap the camera, and sometimes we wanna use it to pan the camera in a certain direction. So outside of this class, we are going to create a new class called custom inspector objects with all the series serialized fields we're going to want. Don't forget to add the system.serialize attribute at the top. Next, I want to create an enum so we can select which direction the camera will pan in the inspector. And finally, let's create one more class called MyScriptEditor, which inherits from editor. Make sure you are using the Unity Editor namespace. First, we'll set the target to our main class at the top and then use the onInspectorGUI method, which is a built-in Unity method for creating custom inspector elements. So what I want is if this bool is checked in the inspector, then I want these two variables to actually show up in the inspector. And if this is checked in the inspector, then these three variables are going to show up. Don't forget to create a public variable for the custom inspector objects class in the top class. So first we'll draw the default inspector. And then if our swap camera is checked, we'll create two new serialized fields of type Cinemachine virtual camera. And if that's not an option for you, then add the using Cinemachine namespace at the top. And if pan camera on contact is checked, we'll create three new serialized fields, one for our enum and two for our floats. And finally, we need to check if the GUI has changed, meaning did we select any of these bools in the inspector? And if we did, then use the set dirty method. If we don't call this, then each time you hit play on your game, the objects you assign in the inspector are going to reset, which we don't want. Now we have some nice custom inspector elements. They don't do anything yet, but this is going to help keep those triggers nice and clean so that we don't have unwanted stuff in the inspector that we're not going to use. Not sure why, but I had to play the game once to get this message to go away, but but it was fine after that. Make sure you set your player tag to player. And finally, go back in, grab our collider reference from this game object and create an on trigger enter 2D and on trigger exit 2D function. If the pan camera on contact bool is checked, we're going to pan the camera when we enter the collider and when we exit the collider. And you'll see this working soon. Let's create the actual panning methods in the camera manager script. You'll need some new variables at the top and then we'll actually create the pan camera method. You can keep the parameters the same in both methods methods. I just prefer calling public methods instead of calling coroutines because it's easier. So we'll just pass in the arguments from one to the other. And again, we'll use the bool argument to determine whether or not the camera needs to pan back to its normal level or not so that we don't need to build two different functions. If we are handling the actual camera pan, then we'll set the direction and distance based on our enum that we set up. Otherwise, if we're returning to the beginning, we'll set the direction and distance back to what they were at the start. Then we'll pan the camera in whatever direction it needs to go by lerping our tracked object offset. Go back to our camera control trigger script and call the actual pan camera method. Let's make this object a prefab. So we can see if we enter the box, it pans in the direction we set in the inspector. And as soon as we exit the box, either here or here, it'll go back to normal. But now as we approach this ledge, it's pretty obvious based on the camera movement that it is indeed safe for us to fall down. Now to handle swapping cameras. Go back to our camera manager script, and this one's not gonna be too bad. You can extend the functionality if you want, but I'm only ever going to be swapping cameras based on my level design when you are moving through rooms horizontally, either left or right. 
If you need to add an up or down, you can add that, but I'm just gonna handle left and right. So let's add those as arguments, as well as a vector two for the direction we are exiting the trigger from. We don't wanna swap our cameras when we enter a trigger because the player might stop halfway on top of the collider and then turn around and go back. And now you've got the wrong camera applied on the player. So we need to know what direction our player is exiting from, not entering. So we can say if our current camera is the camera from the left and our exit direction was on the right, then we need to swap the camera. And we can do that by activating the new camera and deactivating the old camera. You can do the same thing by changing the priority number on the virtual camera as well, but I prefer this activate and deactivate method. Let's also not forget to update our current camera variable as well as our current framing transposer variable. Otherwise, as soon as we change cameras, some of the earlier functions functionality that we built won't work. And also we want to do the same thing if our current camera is the camera from the right and our exit direction is on the left. Now to test this, we need to call it. So back in our camera control trigger script, let's swap the camera if we have that selected in the inspector and our two camera fields have valid cameras attached. Now we can easily pass in our camera on left and camera on right variables, but we need the exit direction. To calculate that, we can take the transform.position of the collision, which is our player, minus the center of the bounds of the box collider on this game object. Don't forget to normalize it. And now we can pass that in as the direction. To test this, let's put one over here and thin out the trigger area. Next, we need another camera to switch to. Go ahead and duplicate this camera two times. Let's call the first one no Y follow cam and the other one locked position cam. Go ahead and add these to your public array in the camera manager. Again, this is really just to set which camera is active when we first play the game. For the no Y follow cam, to disable any vertical movement, I simply increased the dead zone height and the soft zone height. Any player movement inside of the dead zone area will not move the camera. So now it's gonna follow horizontally, but not vertically within the dead zone. I also changed the screen Y position to 0.75. You can see all of my settings here. And since we get a more open room over here, I'll add another trigger over here and change it from the no Y follow on the left to the center player cam on the right. And finally, we'll add one more trigger. I actually have a fake wall over here leading to this secret room. And notice the camera bounds stop right at the border of this room, so it won't give any indication that it's actually there. But we'll add a trigger here and swap from the center player cam to the locked position cam on the right. Now the locked position cam, first off, let's get rid of the confiner. We want this camera locked, not following our player. So instead of following our follow player object, let's create an empty and place it inside this room and have the camera follow that. That way we can frame the room in whatever way we want. Also get rid of the tracked object offset so it'll frame things perfectly. Now this is extremely important. Make sure we have the correct camera active based on our player location, meaning if our player is going to start in the open room, make sure that we have our open camera activated and make sure that all the other cameras are inactive. Cinemachine uses the most recently activated virtual camera. Go ahead and hit play and you can see we have a nice camera follow that tries to keep the player centered on the screen, except when it's near the camera boundary. We get to this corridor, now it follows horizontally, but not vertically, since it's switched to our other camera. And now we go back to the open camera and it follows us vertically again. And right here, based on the camera position, there's no way to tell there's a secret room to the right over here, but we can walk right through that fake wall and it'll smoothly pan to our locked position camera, framing the area of the room we told it to. And if we leave, it'll smoothly transition back to the other camera. One thing to note is that if you don't like how the camera pans from one to the other, you can go to your Cinemachine brain here. The default blend is set to ease in and out, and it takes two seconds. You can also create a custom curve, and you can also create a custom blend just between specific cameras if you wanna be able to do that. Lastly, we obviously wanna be able to add camera shake to our camera, or this is all for nothing. I'm not going to do that in this tutorial because I already made an in-depth tutorial on how you can do that in Cinemachine right here. So what do you think? Let me know of any improvements or anything you do differently down in the comments so we can all benefit from this tutorial. I had to figure all of this out myself because there's shockingly little material for these types of camera systems for Cinemachine online, and I'd love to know any improvements that you guys make to this system. If you found the video helpful, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for game dev tips, motivation, tutorials, and dev vlogs. Bye guys. I want to thank Yaku Biangdok for supporting us on Patreon. Head on over there if you want monthly alpha builds, early access to videos, and more.